Good evening. My name is Leila Ilaraza, and I'm a student project manager at the Clark Forum for Contemporary Issues at Dickinson College. Before we begin, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge that Dickinson College is on the unceded lands of the Susquehannock Nation. We hereby recognize the prior status and enduring diversity of this land and the many indigenous nations that stand in relation to it, particularly the thousands of indigenous children from dozens of tribes forced into, into the reprogramming camp established at the Carlisle Indian Industrial School starting in 1879. Dickinson College supported this agenda of cultural eradication in both word and deed. Turning honestly toward that shameful past animates this acknowledgement and gives orientation to our desire for a reconciled future. Accordingly, this living land acknowledgement is intentionally incomplete, a reflection of the ongoing process it represents. To learn respectfully from the stories of this land and the peoples that carry them, to think reflectively about the injustice in our shared past, and to act responsibly with that knowledge today to inspire a more equitable tomorrow. On behalf of the Clark Forum, Dickinson College, the Glover Memorial Fund, the Department of Physics and Astronomy, the Center for Sustainability Education, and the Churchill Fund, I would like to welcome you to tonight's Glover Memorial Lecture, Uncertainty in Uncertainty in Climate Change Research, an Integrated Approach. This event is a part of the Clark Forum's Leadership in an Age of Uncertainty series. There will be a question and answer session immediately following the program, so please hold all questions until that time. The Clark Forum welcomes differences of opinion expressed politely, thoughtfully, and succinctly. Disruptive behavior or harassment of the speaker, members of the Dickinson community, or audience members will not be tolerated. As a show of respect for our speaker and everyone in attendance, please stay until the end of the program, including the question and answer session. Now, please join me in welcoming Dr. Neil Leary, who will be introducing our speaker, Dr. Linda O'Mearns. Thank you very much for, uh, for that opening statement. Uh, um, uh, thank you all for, for coming this evening. Um, as you know, we rescheduled uh, from last night uh, to tonight. Um, our speaker um, had a mishap and an injury. Um, she is feeling well enough to do the talk tonight. Um, uh, you will note that she will be sitting over here rather than at the podium. Um, so, uh, um, but we will go on with, uh, with our uh, planned activities. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce this evening's speaker, Dr. Linda Mearns, senior scientist at the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado. Dr. Mearns is an exceptional scientist who has made and is making important contributions to regional climate modeling and analysis and the use of regional climate projections for making decisions about how to respond to and limit risks from a changing climate. Linda is also a colleague with whom I worked uh, with before coming to Dickinson 15 years ago. Uh, she's a good friend, um, and it's really um, been a great joy, a pleasure to uh, have Linda here uh, for the last couple days and reconnect, um, despite what happened yesterday. But I'm so glad that, that you've come. This, is, this has uh, been a, a great opportunity for me. Um, and I'm hoping that all of you will, will uh, enjoy the evening's lecture. Um, before relating uh, to you Linda's impressive professional accomplishments, I'll share some information about her education that I think will resonate with many of uh, you. Um, as an undergraduate at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, Linda majored in philosophy. Um, then she, uh, uh, she also did a, uh, a diploma in French language studies uh, at a university in France. I'm not going to embarrass myself by trying to pronounce the name of, of uh, that university. Um, so um, just as an aside, when you're home for Thanksgiving um, in a couple of weeks uh, and someone pointedly asks, what can you do with a philosophy major? or a language studies major, or what have you, you might answer them this way. Um, well, one option is to become a regional climate modeler. 
assist people in adapting to changing climate risks, and maybe participate in work that wins a Nobel Peace Prize. Now, may I trouble you to please pass the sweet potatoes? So Linda, um, she earned a master's degree and doctoral degree um, in geography and climatology at the University of California in Los Angeles. Um, she then launched a 40-year career at the National Center for Atmospheric Research, or NCAR is the acronym. Um, some might think that a 40-year career at one institution, they might think that's limiting, that's isolating, but not so for Linda. Her work has reached beyond NCAR to have national and international impacts on science and policy uh, communities grappling with how to respond to global climate change. A number of questions have given purpose to Linda's research. Um, how will climate change at regional scales? It's the regional and local scales that really, you know, that's where people experience the effects of climate change. That's where agriculture and water resources and ecosystems, it's really thinking about that you know, regional local scale that's important. Um, so trying to understand how climate may change at those scales, how confident or uncertain should we be about projections of climate change at these fine resolutions of, of, of regional and local climate? Um, are some climate projections or climate models better than others? What do we mean by better? Better for what? How would we know? What will be the impacts of climate change in specific places for water availability, food production, food security, public health? What actions can or should be taken to prepare and to adapt? And critically, how does uncertainty, which will feature in Linda's talk, how does uncertainty shape how we prepare and how we adapt? So at NCAR, Linda has uh, led numerous research programs that have explored these questions. She's led uh, uh, multi-agency research programs, such as the North American Regional Climate Change Assessment Program, the North American Coordinated Regional Development Downscaling Programs. These are massive uh, activities that involve scientists from lots of institutions, lots of federal agencies. Um, Linda was an influential participant in all four of the U.S. national climate change assessments, uh, the first of which was published in 2000, the most recent in 2018. Linda has also been an important contributor to every major climate change assessment of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change since 1995. So there have been five. Um, so she wasn't involved in the first one, but everyone since then, and there have been five of these, these reports. Last year, you may recall that Dickinson hosted uh, a climate symposium that featured many IPCC scientists and other experts. Linda was one of our speakers for that, speaking remotely from Boulder um, for that. And the focus of that was findings from the most recent IPCC report that was published in 2021 and 2022. The US and the IPCC climate assessments are major undertakings that bring together hundreds of scientists and experts to review and synthesize what is known and what is uncertain about how the climate has changed, how it's likely to change, and what risks it poses, and how we can respond to it. The IPCC reports are the most comprehensive, painstakingly reviewed, widely cited, and scientifically credible sources of global scale information about climate change. The audiences for the reports include public and private sector decision makers and policy makers in the US and internationally uh, who need the best possible information to make sound decisions. Uh, Linda's been an important and influential contributor to all of this work um, and has earned a number of recognitions uh, uh, for that. In 2006, Linda was elected as a fellow of the American Meteorological Society. She received the Lifetime Achievement and the Excellence in Research Awards from the Association of American Geographers in 2015 and 16. In 2007, the IPCC was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, an honor in which Linda and uh, her colleagues in the IPCC share. More recently, Linda was awarded a Purple Heart by her staff at the uh, National Center for Atmospheric Research for wounds suffered in multiple IPCC campaigns in which she has participated. There's a little joke inside there that um, um, Linda may chat with you about after the event. Um, I had the, pri the privilege and great pleasure of working with Linda on the IPCC 
CDC's third assessment report, um, and later in another activity after that. Um, in these collaborations, Linda had the great patience and goodwill to teach me, a social scientist, a fair bit about climate science, regional scale climate modeling, uncertainties in regional projections, and that knowledge, that information she imparted to me en enabled me to do my work better, to do that more effectively. Now to say that, that it's not the same as making my work easier, working with Linda is rich, it's rewarding, it's pleasurable, it's challenging, but easy? Mm, not so much. So, my prediction for this evening is that Linda's lecture will be rich and rewarding and challenging, but not so easy. Now, I would uh, invite uh, Professor uh, David Jackson and Dr. Linda Mearns uh, to come to the podium for a presentation of the Glover Award. Uh, how about over here? Um, good evening, and be before getting to the actual presentation of the Glover Medal, I, as a physicist, I feel obligated to say at least a few words about uncertainty and the nature of science. Um, if I'm being honest, I think the topic of uncertainty is not, not the most exciting aspect of science, and we usually don't spend as much time on it as we should. But as I often tell my students, the most important part of any measurement is the uncertainty estimate. Why? Because it's impossible to measure anything with infinite, infinite precision. So the quality of the measurement is determined exclusively by the uncertainty. In fact, it's precisely the uncertainty that allows us, that guides our thinking, allows us to rule out different theories and ultimately helps improve our theories. The Glover Memorial Award was established in 1958 to honor teaching and public outreach in physics and astronomy. It was endowed by John Yeagley, the brother of Dickinson physics professor Henry Yeagley, in honor of their relative John Glover. Glover was an English scientist who developed a method for boosting the efficiency of sulfuric acid production by passing gases through a structure now known as a Glover Tower. The medal we are about to give Dr. Mearns is a replica of the one given to Glover in 1896 in honor of his scientific achievement. So, Dr. Linda Mearns, on behalf of the Clark Forum for Contemporary Issues, the Center for Sustainability Education, and the Department of Physics and Astronomy, it is an honor to present to you the 2023 Glover Medal. Well, gee, I'm, I'm kind of, um, I'm amazed. Um, really, thank you very much. It's, it, I don't think I anticipated this. Of course, I didn't even anticipate actually being here today to give a lecture. So everything is, it's a surprise at this point. But it, it's really very nice. Um, the box is very nice. <laughs> And um, the combination is, is very nice, almost as nice as my Purple Heart for my work in the IPCC, so thank you. I assume now I can go over to talking about what I'm talking about. So, um, I I thought I'd be a little bit more uh, specific about what happened yesterday. Uh, I experienced an unplanned contact between my mouth and the sidewalk um, on my way to do an interview with the students. So this becomes a long story, but it's convenient for this lecture because there was a lot of uncertainty about, well, would I be able to do the lecture last night? After a, a long time in urgent care, it was beginning to look kind of doubtful. And I, I actually now pride myself, pride myself rather, in um, that I've actually learned to deal with uncertainty, not all uncertainties, but some uncertainties, 
pretty well. And so I was actually pretty, pretty cool about this. Like, well, if it happens, fine. If it doesn't happen, fine. Um, and then it was definitely looking like this is not going to happen. Uh, but then it all fell into place to do it tonight. And so since I wasn't going anywhere as planned, um, it really all fell into place. The one problem is that um, my pronunciation probably is not quite as good as it usually is. The way in which I drink water is a little strange. It's kind of like out of the side of my mouth. But that's good. Um, but anyway, I'm very glad it all came together. And I'm very glad to be speaking with you this evening. And I'm very glad for everyone who showed up, because I thought, man, how many people are going to show up when it was supposed to be last night? Um, so I'm, I'm really very heartened by the presence of all of you. So um, one of the things I've studied for a long time is indeed uncertainty in climate change research. And there, there are a number of reasons for this. Um, and I think I'll, I'll illustrate this actually through part of my introduction. which is to talk about Hurricane Katrina, which is going back to 2005. Um, at that time, at NCAR, I was, a, um, I was the deputy director of the Institute for the Study of Society and the Environment. And uh, the director was out of town, and so I went to the director's meeting for this, and it was the day after Katrina hit New Orleans. And um, NCAR is made up of a number of different divisions and labs. And some of my colleagues there um, were just so pleased and so thrilled with the quality of the prediction for Katrina, they were just going on and on about this. And I just found that to be extremely depressing. Because of course, uh, the reality was that there were over 1,800 fatalities uh, and over $100 billion worth of damage. And it just seemed very odd to me, quite frankly, that these you know, top-notch scientists were sitting around talking about what a great forecast this was. Um, and since I was in this institute that concerned both the environment and um, social sciences, I thought more about the problem. So why, you know, what's wrong with this picture? And it had to do with the fact that um, I felt as if they were, there was nothing wrong, I guess, with celebrating the success of the uh, prediction. But it seemed very odd to do that, given the damage that had been wrought by this hurricane. So I thought more about the whole problem of um, vulnerability. It's like, <laughs> what good is the most fantastic forecast in the world if nobody is prepared or able to cope with it? What is the point? And so I started looking at other aspects of um, hurricanes in particular. And looking at this is, diagram is one of the social sensitivity to climate impacts index. You can think of it as being basically a, a map of the degree of vulnerability to uh, climate type extremes. And um, some areas, for example, Puerto Rico, so the very high scale is up here. Uh, and we know from events later that indeed Puerto Rico is very um, vulnerable to hurricanes. And that there's a lot of variability across um, 
the United States, a lot of vulnerability, for example, in South Texas, through the major areas of the South and so forth. And it's like, I just really became very interested in about the issue of integration across the different parts of the climate problem. So the National Academy of Sciences, the NAS, puts out a lot of really great research reports. And one of them, back in 2017, was the integrating social and behavioral sciences within the weather enterprise. All right, so this is the weather, not climate, but obviously they're related. And so I pulled out this quote from it. To shift focus from forecasts of atmospheric conditions to the protect protection of life and property, an enhancement of the national economy is not an incremental step, but a major shift in emphasis. So this report was really talking about how to integrate, for example, major social sciences into, let's say, weather forecasts. And, um, it was a really great thing to see that the National Academy was re recognizing the importance of this. All right, so this is a bit of an, an introduction to what I'm going to be talking about. So let's get to a few definitions, one of them being what is uncertainty. Um, there are, a, there's of course, uncertainty about the definition, um, but I think a not bad one is just to say a state of lack of knowledge or incomplete knowledge, or more completely, there's a more complex one about incomplete knowledge with a random component reflecting random processes, for example, uh, rolling of dice. And so you can think of uncertainty in a certain ways being a combination of that random uncertainty and the epistemic uncertainty um, resulting from our incomplete knowledge due to the complexity of the world. And very often, but not in all cases, probability is viewed as a standard measure of uncertainty. Now, climate change is imbued with many uncertainties, and it's viewed as being a primarily a super wicked problem. And wicked problems is actually a technical term. Um, and wicked problems describe public policy concerns that defy optimal solutions. Each wicked problem is unique, so it's hard to learn from one wicked problem to the next. It's hard to define different ideas on the nature of the problem. And of course, it's characterized by deep uncertainties. Um, there are also many interde interdependencies and causes that interact, and it, they interact and evolve in a dynamic social context. So in point of fact, I think we can say comfortably that we live in a world of many, many wicked, wicked problems. Uh, deep uncertainty, you can probably just have a sense of what this is. It's a condition in which parties to a decision do not know or agree on the models that relate their actions to consequences. Um, the prior probability distributions, don't worry if you're not familiar with that. For key parameters for these models and the importance of various objectives their actions seek to achieve. So it's, you know, it's really deep, these uncertainties. Uh, one of my favorite quotes, I have a whole collection of quotes about uncertainty, but this is the one that I think is most apt in many ways. It's that doubt is not a pleasant condition but certainty is an absurd one. And I think one of the points that I want to get across this evening is that, first of all, we all deal with uncertainty all the time. It's just a quality. It's, it, it's just simply part of being alive. Now, I particularly became very interested in this um, once we started doing these uh, long, advanced study program colloquia at NCAR on uncertainty in climate change research and integrated approach. And here's just a, a picture of um, the group we had. This was dedicated to primarily graduate students, postdocs, early career scientists. And 
one of the great things was that we were able to, people had to apply to be part of this, but we paid for everybody. So everybody, and these lasted for about 10 days to two weeks. Um, and I'll tell you, as, as Neil indicated, I've had a lot of great experiences in my career, but I'll tell you that doing these colloquia was probably in many ways the highlight of my career because these folks, these young people, um, they just loved it. And there's nothing like going to a huge AGU meeting, the American Geophysical Union, five years after this, and having people just stop me you know, on the street and still tell me what a great experience it was and how it really changed their research directions. And you know, that's really incredibly satisfying. I'd say um, in many ways more satisfying than being part of an organization that got the Nobel Peace Prize, quite frankly. Although this, this is really nice. Um, so, hmm, blank, well, something will appear. Okay, why did we do this colloquium? Well, um, first of all, I didn't do it alone. These are my co-chairs, Chris Forrest, Haley Fowler, Rob Lempert, and Rob Wilby. We wanted these, these folks to understand the strands of uncertainty throughout the climate change problem in order to maximize effectiveness in any one area. In other words, we didn't want everybody to become these huge um, integrating scientists, not necessarily. But I think my next point is, yeah, right, it doesn't mean that all are supposed to become highly interdisciplinary research, but it did mean that hopefully their research activities would be informed by and benefit from the larger uncertainty context. And one of the signs of the, the desire, the need for this was, you know, I, I've worked a lot with a lot of statisticians. I think of myself as being a statistics groupie in some ways. Um, and I'd see my colleagues write these articles about, you know, a very sophisticated probabilistic model dedicated to some aspect of climate change. But, it wasn't really connected to anything else about climate change. And I knew that that article probably was just gonna, that climate scientists were never gonna read it. And it was just gonna be read by other statisticians. There's not necessarily anything wrong with that, but I think that's somewhat limiting. Okay, so from these, uh, these several colloquia we did, uh, we also put together a, uh, a book, an edited volume, through the Springer, and it should appear, hopefully, in 2024. Those are the same co-editors I mentioned earlier, and um, there are about 28 chapters. And the topics include particularly policy and decision-making, and I'll make an argument as to why one should start with that as opposed to the other topics. Impacts, uncertainties, the impacts, uncertainties in the impacts of climate change, the uncertainties in the future climate, determining what the future climate will be, quantification methods, and then some integrated themes. Oh dear, I'm already in deep problems, but, but you guys used up a lot of my time. <laughs> How do I get it back? All right, I'll try not to complain. Um, but some of this I'm gonna to have to go through a little quickly. So the whole topic of integrated science has really come to, to the fore in a lot of uh, areas. Um, another National Academy studies um, is this report on convergence. And by convergence, we kind of mean super interdisciplinarity, but really encouraging that, and saying that merging ideas, approaches, and technologies from widely diverse fields of knowledge at a high level of integration is one crucial strategy for solving complex problems. And um, as a matter of fact, NSF, the National Science Foundation, has a whole problem, program on um, convergence research. Okay, so one of the dangers, of talking about uncertainty, or so my communications experts have told me, 
is if you do that, people will be left almost immediately that you don't know anything and that this is not good. Um, and it's true, this can happen. And certainly, uncertainty, especially in climate change research, has been used as a political football. Um, and there have been periods in the past, depending upon the um, in administration in charge of the United States, that have really emphasized the uncertainty for the sake of undermining any efforts to do something about the problem. Um, but that is not to say that there isn't uncertainty. There is, but it all depends upon how you deal with it. But in keeping with my communications colleagues, I will say, but first, what do we know about climate change? And we know actually quite a lot. And I'll just give you a quick example of that. Um, this is from the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. I think Neil kind of gave you a picture of what it is. Um, and it's gone back, the first reports were out in 1990. And what I'm just showing you here is how a statement about what we believe about the trends in temperature, what causes it and so forth, um, what we've learned over the decades since 1990. So it started off with a very uncommittal, non-committal, yeah, non-committal statement. Uh, the observed increase in temperatures could be largely due to natural variability. In other words, just year-to-year -year variability having nothing to do with what people do. Alternatively, this variability and other man-made factors could have offset a still larger man-made greenhouse warming. So it's a little convoluted. Unfortunately, you should never look at the IPCC, especially the summary for policymakers, as good examples of clean, concise language and I will, don't have the time to go into exactly why this is, but feel free to ask me a question about this towards the end. All right, so we go through. So 1995, a big watershed event. The balance of evidence suggests a discernible human influence on global climate. And I'm not exaggerating to say all hell broke loose at that point when such an august body as the IPCC came out with that kind of uh, very clear statement. And then the statement just kept on getting clearer and clearer. It's 2001, there's now new and stronger evidence that most of the warming observed over the last 50 years is due to human activities. 2007, most of the observed increase in global temperatures since the mid 20th century is very likely due to the observed increases in greenhouse gases concentrations. 2013, it's now extremely likely. So what's going to happen then? We're going to go extremely, extremely, extremely. Um, how certain can you get? Well, 2021, it became, it is indisputable that human activities are causing climate change. And it will be, I will set, stop to say in that, in that report, when that, was, um, when that report was accepted, and it's accepted by a body of all the nations that participate, um, there was an effort to just you know, stop doing this indisputable, the very likely, just say human activities are causing climate change. But there was resistance to that because that was too stark for some of the countries. They wanted just, just a little bit of wiggle room. But I don't see how indisputable gives you much wiggle room. Anyway. Um, all right, let's look at some of the other uh, new event, uh, events from the past that are very important from the point of view of affecting natural and human society. So Hurricane Sandy. And from my conversations with some of you, it appears that Hurricane Sandy did have something of an effect even on Carlisle. Yes? Maybe? Any of you here remember this? Yes? Um, so to hit New Jersey, and when you look at the extremes, the 10 top high water events at Lower Manhattan, and by the way, I'm from New York, and so this, um, this event was important to me because I have um, a lot of friends in New York still. So 
this diagram just shows the different high water levels going back to 1950. Um, and you can see, and this is the, the high water levels, the storm surge, and here's the level 10.5 feet at which point the New York City subway system floods. Um, and needless to say, it really flooded. And it went up, the storm surge went up close to 14 feet. This was a very important event. Um, and I think what happens with these extreme events is that a lot of people's opinions about climate change tend to change. And I certainly think this is true uh, for the governor of New Jersey at that time. And um, there have been articles demonstrating that when people are affected by extremes related to climate, they tend to stop doubting that climate change is happening. The problem with that is we can't wait for everybody in the world to be affected by an extreme. By then, we'll all be in very, very deep trouble. All right. And so here is our, my required flooding in New York City subway station from uh, that event. All right. Hurricane Harvey. Um, another major event. This was published by a good colleague of mine, Carrie Emanuel, in a very good journal in 2017. This is to give you a feel for how these events could change even more as we go through climate change. Largest rainfall, this was the largest rainfall of any hurricane on record at that point. The annual, the probability of 500 millimeters of that level of rainfall was only 1%, 1981 to 2000. With one of the scenarios going into the future, it will increase to 18% um, by the end of the 21st century. And assuming that the probability increase is more or less linear, that meant that in 2017, the actual probability was about 6%, a six-fold increase over what it had been up through 2000. All right, another important theme that we need to cover is the integrated climate change problem. And um, by the end of this talk, I'm not really going to be able to say um, that we succeeded in integrating all the part of this problem. But this is actually a di diagram back from 2001, uh, just showing the way the different parts of the problem fit together. Um, and where adaptation and mitigation can um, mitigate the problem. And the nice thing about this diagram is that it's, it's circular. There's no real beginning or ending to it. Uh, very often, it used to be that you'd start off with the emis emissions and concentrations. From these, you use climate models to determine what the climate change is. From that, you could come to the impacts on human and natural systems. Um, which then could further interact to determine the socioeconomic development paths of the future, which would affect the emissions and concentrations. The diagram is often kind of this linear one where you start off with the causes, the emissions, the natural perturbations, and so forth. You figure out what the climate change is going to be. From that, you figure out what the impacts will be on agriculture, water resources, and so forth. And then from that, you decide what policy management decisions you should make. Well, one of the main points I make in this talk is that this diagram is all wrong, and it leads you in the wrong direction. That really, the decision making should be the central focus. both for mitigation and adaptation. And if you start with the decision making, you can actually manage the uncertainties in all these parts much more easily. Um, 
Now, here's a definition of adaptation. I think this is out of place, but making adjustments to human activities that reduce the negative effects of climate change, coping with climate change, all right? Here's another diagram. I think I'm already in trouble time-wise. Is, is it really 740? No. Yes? Hmm. Okay. Um, here's another, this is a really great diagram from the 2014 Working Group 2 report of the IPCC. And what's nice about this is climate is there, of course it's very important, but it's kind of balanced in this diagram with the socioeconomic processes. And the central part of the diagram is, ow, um, um, risk. And how do we control and mitigate the risk of the climate hazards that are coming our way? Um, meaning of risk, the likelihood of an event times the impact of that event. Risk management, okay, I'm going to skip that. Um, all right, so here's the outline of the rest of the talk, some of which is going to go very quickly. Sadly, I could speak for several more hours on this, but feel free to contact me later for everything I don't cover. Um, we're going to talk about the uncertainties in the future climate, the imp uncertainties in the impacts of climate change, and most important, the approaches to decision making under uncertainty. How do we deal with the uncertainty in the reality of the decisions that have to be made, both adaptation and mitigation? So here's a timeline that I kind of made up, um, and I haven't really discussed all these yet, but it's a timeline of when different parts of the uncertainty problem became, came to the fore, and people were writing about it and studying it. So we started off with the climate system, import, the climate system uh, uncertainties back about 1990. Then after that, there was more work on determining, well, what are the emissions in the future going to be, which involves a great deal of uncertainty about the entire society. Um, internal variability, another part of the climate problem. Um, then the impacts models, the different impacts models that are going to tell us what the impacts of the climate change are on different systems. And then down here is DMUU, which is decision making under uncertainty. This really came to the fore, I don't know, maybe about 2005 or so. Um, something that's really been neglected, I think, is the uncertainties about how vulnerable we are. And that really needs more work. And then by 2020, there's been a lot of integration through the most recent IPCC reports. Okay, so the uncertainties about the future climate, basically there are three. Um, the future trajectory of the emissions, is based on the uncertainties about how the world will develop economically, socially, politically, and technologically. And I think we know that the world from day to day has a great deal of uncertainty. Um, how the climate system would respond to these future emissions, studied by looking at climate models, but the climate models are incomplete. Um, and there are some processes that are just not well modeled. Then there's the internal variability, which is explored through initial condition experiments. Um, and this is an irreducible uncertainty. It's just the chaotic nature of the climate system. And in interest of time, I'm going to skip that. So the future emissions and concentrations, this is from the most recent IPCC report. And I've labeled these. So these are the different concentrations, emissions rather, of carbon dioxide. Um, ranging up above 120 gigatons of CO2 per year. And I've labeled them with these little name tags about sort of what the nature of the society would be. So this top one is fossil fuel. Um, many now believe that this is virtually impossible. I'm not sure it's impossible, but it's basically that, you know, we just use fossil fuel until there aren't any more. Um, then there are sort of medium, medium range ones, and then these low ones that are sustainability, in which we really 
use alternative energies and really bring the level down to levels where we can all, and by all I mean humans, animals, plants, everybody can survive. Um, the uncertainty in the response of the climate system to the forcing, the problem is that different climate models respond differently to external forcing. And there's been a lot of work comparing the response of these models. Um, here are the results from the most recent IPCC. This is showing the temperature change going out to 2100. And these are these different emissions paths that I showed you earlier. And so from these, the temperature change by the end of the 20th first century could be 5 degrees or down actually below 1.5 degrees. And 1.5 is a very important threshold uh, for the survivability of humans and other beings. All right, here's just another sample. I'm not going to show you all of this, but here's the, an example of September Arctic sea ice. It's a very important phenomenon. Um, and here are these different scenarios again. And you can see that for the highest one, the SSP 5, 8.5, the Arctic would essentially be ice free by 2050, which um, would be quite amazing to behold. So that's all I'm going to cover with uh, the uncertainty in the climate. Uncertainty and impact. So for all those years, all the uncertainty was assumed. It's all in the climate system. If we can just nail that down, we'll be fine. But then some people, including yours truly, by looking at different types of impacts models, and by impacts models, I mean, for example, here I'm talking about models that um, show the development of crops and what yield will be produced by crops. Um, and although this explanation is going to take a little time, I think it's worth it, because it'll give you a, a feel for how science really works. And it's kind of very interesting. So um, I was working with crop models at that point and also regional climate models. But I want you to just focus on these two things. This is just using a fine scale climate scenario and saying what the change in the crop yield would be, I guess, towards the end of the 21st century. And with the EPIC crop model, you see increases in the red there. The, but with the series crop model, you see only decreases. And it's like, huh? How is it possible that we're getting these completely opposite responses? That's big uncertainty. So I presented these results to a, an eminent colleague of mine at the University of Florida. And he, it was an amazing moment. He said, there's something wrong. These can't be right. These can't actually be the results of these crop models. They cannot be giving opposite results. Go back and do it again. So we went back and we checked our data, looked at everything, and the important thing was to find out if we could really explain why they differed. And that's where a lot of the science is. If you can't find out why, then you're kind of left with, well, I don't know. So we did. We looked at these results very carefully. And it turned out it had to do with the very different way in which these two models modeled the grain filling part of the process. So we were right. My esteemed colleague was wrong. Since then, through many programs, there have been these other models. There's now like this AGMIP, the Agricultural Multimodel um, Program that is looking at those. And my good colleague, Cynthia Roosevelt Sawaik, has, has developed this. And you can see, I don't have time to go through all this, but this 
The gray area tells you, these are with some scenarios for the future, for maize, for the mid to high latitudes, using a number of different crop models, seven to be precise, and then wheat in the high, mid to high latitudes. And you can see that the uncertainty, if you just look at the gray area as to how they're responding, there's a lot of situations where they're both, some of them are showing positive results and some are showing negative. And so this kind of study really pointed out, gee, there's a lot of uncertainty there that we weren't even aware of. Now, why? Why weren't we aware of that? Because it has to do with the structure of science in some ways, that there was the group that used the series model. All right, and that's what they did. They developed the series model and they used it. Then there was this whole other bunch of colleagues who used the EPIC model. But they didn't talk to each other and they didn't really interact, partially because they were in competition with each other. And so it's another great example of how science can get into a lot of trouble by being too isolated. OK. Um, oh, man. All right. I'm going to have to skip a lot of this. So that's my example of the uncertainty in, um, in impacts models. But it's also a, the case, you get the same problem if you look at um, hydrologic models and even economic models. So I just don't have time to go through that. Um, but what's really important is for me to get to the decision making under uncertainty. Now, this esteemed colleague of mine from Australia, Roger Jones, developed this diagram of the uncertainty explosion. Policy paralysis, you have too much uncertainty. If you're just constantly building more and more uncertainty, eventually you get to the situation, you can't deal with it, you throw up your hands. I don't know what happens, but it's really bad. But there are other ways of looking at it. I mean, notice that this is once again this top-down diagram where we're starting with emission scenarios, then the global, global climate models, um, biophysical impacts, and the socioeconomic impacts. So I call this the standard top-down approach. All right, but there are other ways of looking at this. And the, this is getting back, again, to the decision-centric climate science where you focus on identifying the vulnerabilities of the system, in this case, it's a hydrologic system. You identify the climate changes that are problematic, and you evaluate options to improve the robustness to such climate changes. In other words, you figure out what are the problem climates for the system to begin with. And then you start from that, and then build around decisions that will guard against those problems. Now, I have a very long section here about this study we did for Fort Hood water supply and flood risk. And I don't have time to go through it. But to say that this would be an, an illustration of the, the system that I just described, uh, maybe I'll try to show you this, in which there are all these uncertainties. Here are the projections of climate change. They look at which ones are problematic. Skip that part. Here are the hydrologic model uncertainties, and then here's the possibilities for planning alternatives. I know you, there's no way you can get this whole thing because I'm going too quickly, but then finally you get out to, and you determine from these, which of these you can handle with your planning and which you can't. So the gray you can handle, the black you can't, and then you really focus on what to do about those that are, excuse me, not easily handled um, by that system. So there have been many studies now of this in ag economics, in hydrology, in uh, ecosystems work, um, in fire work, a lot of them. But one, one area that has not received enough attention, I think, is the uncertainty about vulnerability. How do we know how vulnerable we are? Especially when we keep coming up with these amazing surprises. 
I mean, look, for example, at what happened to Al Capulco most recently. A pretty rich city, and the damage was huge. One of the reasons was, all right, we've got good forecasts, but the intensification of that storm was amazing. It went from being just a, another middle tropical cyclone to a category five in like, I may be exaggerating a little bit, but like 24 hours. That's amazing. But it is also something that is being established as an aspect of climate change. So knowing more about one's vulnerability is key to making the right decisions. It's amazing how skipping slides help you stay on time, just for those of you who have not given long lectures. All right, so our conclusions. There's a lot more than just climate that is changing and will continue to change and is uncertain. All these factors are uncertain, some more than others. For example, vulnerability of populations. To really deal with the climate problem, we really need, and the uncertainty of it, we really need to focus on the decision-making context. It is the natural integrator across problem parts and uncertainties. So thus, focus on risk reduction, not reduction in uncertainty. There's also a branch of science that, well, all of science is about reducing uncertainty. That's what science is. Not necessarily, at least not in this context, with very complex problems. Um, and you have to recognize the future climate information are scenarios. They are not predictions. They will probably never be predictions, let's say, beyond a few years of that. And then, what is the danger of false, un, false certainty? Which is another way of saying the potential hubris of science. And take, for example, the New York flood protection barrier designed to be 1.5 feet above the 10-foot storm surge of record prior to Hurricane Sandy, and that clearly was not high enough. And if they had really looked at the uncertainty and the types of decisions they would have to make and their vulnerability, Sandy would have been much less disastrous to New Jersey and the other areas. So here is the infamous uncertainty cake. Um, this is a dice, a die with the earth put on top of it, and then this is the ice flowing off of it. This is going to be the cover of the book that will be finished in 2024, come hell or high water, as I say. Uh, and then finally, I like to end with this New Yorker cartoon. Notice Pennsylvania is there. Pennsylvania is right there. Um, but of course, obviously, it's about New York. And clearly, you have sea level rise with the entire Atlantic Ocean flowing in here. I enjoyed showing this. This is a cartoon from 2007. Um, I finally realized, so this is the Empire State Building. I finally realized that, oh, I know how many floors there are in the Empire State Building. So I know now how many are still visible with this sea level rise. And so I calculated roughly the height of a floor and thus how high the sea level rise had to be to cover this much of the New York, the uh, Empire State Building. And uh, I was so pleased when I realized I could do this. I can't tell you. Needless to say, this will not appear in any scientific paper, but I still think it's really neat. Um, anyway, the great news is that that level of sea level rise is impossible, even if all the Arctic and the Antarctic melted. And so I keep, it's on my list, but it keeps falling down for me to send a note to the New Yorker and say, you're unnecessarily scaring people because this sea level rise is not possible. So there we are. And um, don't be afraid of uncertainty. I think we all deal with it all the time. And in most cases, 
we will successfully succeed in dealing with it. I'm a little concerned about whether or not we'll deal with it with climate change, but let us hope. Thanks very much. All right, so at this time, we will begin the question and answer session. Um, because this program is being recorded, we ask that you first raise your hand and wait for a microphone to reach you before asking your question. We reserve the first question for students, but then we will open it up to the rest of the audience. So um, at this point, we're looking for our first question. Hello, thank you so much for coming to speak today. This was really powerful. Thank you. I'm wondering, taking a class on the just energy transition, and I'm wondering if you can speak to the role that communities who are the most directly impacted by an environmental disaster, what role can they play in um, the decision-making processes as we move forward? Oh, I think you know the role of environmental justice specifically is, is really crucial now. Um, and that you, your question has opened up the opportunity for me to mention the COPS, the Conference of the Parties, where major, where global decisions about uh, mitigation are made through uh, this UN body. And I've been involved in a number of them and attended them. Um, the one coming up is going to be very, and by coming up, I mean, you know, in, in a couple of weeks in um, the UEA. Um, one of the major issues there is going to be the issue of loss and damage. And this is, I believe, related to what your question was, where we have a situation where, globally, those countries that have produced most of the greenhouse gases through the past centuries, are less vulnerable to the climate change that is going to happen. And the countries and populations that have not produced many greenhouse gases, let's take, for example, all of Africa, they are going to be suffering much more from the climate changes because they're more vulnerable. So the issue is, Whose responsibility is it to pay for that loss and damage? And this is a very, very tricky political issue. And I'll tell you that the US has tried to stonewall this. I mean, this has been an issue for, oh, at least since the, the Paris meetings. So, you know, clearly 10 years. And the US just stonewalls it until finally, this past time around, they finally said, OK, 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 we'll have a, you know, a loss and damage discussion, forum, et cetera. Um, and it'll be very interesting to see what happens, because the problem is that the, richest, the richer countries are afraid. The US, I happen to know, because I've listened to a lot of their discussions, they're afraid that they're going to get sued that once you open up the floor and say, the rich countries are responsible for producing the climate change, um, then one of the fears is that they could get sued by everybody and anybody for having created the climate catastrophe. Um, so I think the role, I'm not talking about it kind of globally, but and I assume you're talking about it more regionally. Um, I think it's absolutely critical that that be a major issue for this nation and others. I mean, the most vulnerable people have to be um, considered. I mean, because it really is, it is fundamentally a climate, well, it's a justice issue, and both globally and locally. So I think the role that can be played by justice efforts is absolutely critical. Good question, by the way.
Come on, guys, I hurried through these slides to give enough time for questions. Oh, no, Neil. Um, it, it occurs to me that I think for young people in particular, the, the climate issue and when you think about the kinds of things that are being predicted and the, the potential costs involved in trying to fix these things or prevent them from happening, it seems like it might just be how do you prevent yourself from just becoming depressed? If I were... What makes you think I present, prevent myself from becoming depressed? <laughs> Fair enough. Um, no, well, that's a, a perfect... Once again, I love these questions. You almost... I almost feel, you, could, you people could be shills for me. You're asking exactly what I want to answer. Um, when I, a number of years now, ago, I, I gave a, a lecture, not on this exactly, but about climate change in general at Naropa University, a um, Buddhist-inspired university in Boulder, Colorado. And at that point, I sort of forgot that what I was telling these young people was potentially very depressing. But to me, well, it's just the way it is. I've studied this for 35 years. There we are. But their question to me was, what keeps you from just, you know, giving up and lying down? And I, I thought, oh, wow, I, how do I answer this? And then I looked at them and I said, it was one of these epiphanic moments. And I said, you, you prevent me from just lying down on the floor and giving up. Because they were so bright and so dedicated and so concerned about the problem. And, you know, these people are, well, let's say it was 10 years ago, they're out in the world, and I'm sure many of them are doing really great things to fight and deal with environmental change in general, including climate change. And so um, that was my answer then, and that is my answer now. And the fact that, quite frankly, you know, I was very concerned about what was going to happen doing this lecture the next day with it not being announced. And um, I'm really pleased with the, the showing, actually. And I'm just really glad that you all came. And so I, I've never given this kind of lecture to a class of relatively young people in which I, I didn't end up feeling inspired by their concerns and by their willingness to go forward. Um, and so that's my answer. First of all, thank you for a wonderful talk and thank you for coming. Um, we know that the climate system features these tipping points. Um, no, it's... Yeah, and, but I, I guess from what I gather, and I think there was a recent Nature paper, um, we don't quite know at what temperature those tipping points get activated. And I, I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about the uncertainty that injects uh, in is having these tipping points. Uh, um. Yeah, I mean, that's a very important point, and I could sort of glance this off by saying, well, there is uncertainty about the tipping points, um, and it's true. But I, uh, there are, there's at least one tipping point that is considered very important, and that's the 1.5 degrees C tipping point, when the Earth heats up to 1.5 degrees above the pre-industrial level, there's a whole report about this called 1.5 degrees, um, that at that point there will be serious damage to both human and natural systems. Um, 
there's recently an article published in Nature Climate Change indicating that we have less time than we even thought. <laughs> it's interesting. They never say, oh, we have more time than we thought. It's always less time. So now it looks like if this, you know, this is a very well done article, that we have six years before we reach 1.5 degrees, assuming the similar emissions that we have today. And that's very frightening. I mean, six years is really, you know, most of you will be out of college and doing things. I'll be retired. Um, but that's really not very much time. Um, I hope that an article like that will get people to really pay attention, but it's just amazing the degree to which they don't. And that's the most frightening thing. And so there's also the 1.5 and the 2 degrees um, tipping points. And I'll say one more thing, which is also kind of an interesting <laughs> thing about being wrong in science. Um, so it was at the Paris meeting when the Paris convention um, was set up. And I was at that meeting. It was a great meeting. One felt tremendous hope at that meeting. And at that meeting, it was determined they wanted the IPCC to write a report about what will happen at 1.5 degrees. And I thought, oh, please, please, please don't make us do that. These reports take so long. It's so tiring. And I was convinced. I thought, and they're not going to come up with anything, because there's too much variability. And there's not going to be a clear signal of what happens at 1.5 degrees. And so I decided I ain't going to do that. I ain't going to participate in that report. And I didn't. Might have been a good idea anyway, but not because they weren't going to find anything. It's a great report, and they determined that it really is a very important threshold. There's also two degrees. Quite frankly, I don't think there's a chance in hell that we're going to stay below 1.5 degrees. I really don't. But we could stay below two if we really, really tried. So um, these thresholds, these tipping points are very important. There are other that are kind of more precise, like um, you know, what would result in the whole uh, ocean circulation in the Atlantic to collapse. That would be a real catastrophe, certainly. Um, but I think these big ones, like the 1.5, are um, really important to pay attention to. So thank you for the question. We have time for two more questions. Thank you again for uh, coming today. This is really informative and very uh, nice. Um, Thank you. It was a pleasure having you in class earlier this week as well. Um, so my question for you, which was supposed to be for class earlier this week, if we had a little bit more time, um, I feel that there's often a lot of discussion, and you mentioned towards the end of your lecture tonight how countries that produce the most C, um, you know, aren't as affected as, as affected extremely as um, other other countries. Um, so like in Cumberland County, for example, you know, we're certainly seeing effects, but not extremes. You know, our, we're not on an island nation that's going to be underwater in 30 years, or our backyards aren't burning down in wildfires. Um, so what, in your opinion, would be the most effective tool, the best way to vocalize to people who aren't seeing these extremes um, that mitigating on a local level is still very important, even though you're not seeing the extremes in your backyard, just not necessarily yet? OK, let me make sure I, I understood your question. You're saying um, that what to do about the fact that yeah, experiencing extremes makes a big difference, but everybody doesn't experience them. Everybody won't, and so forth. And so what do we do about that? Yeah, just like divergence. Uh, yeah, and, and how do you explain to people that, that say, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not experiencing these extremes. Why should I care? How do you, right. I guess, in, in, in a 
short term, how do you get those people to care? Um, my short answer is I don't know, really. Um, I mean, it's very interesting to me that, you know, for example, uh, a lot of people who are, let's call them climate change deniers or whatever, that, you know, they have children, they have grandchildren. Presumably they will have great grandchildren. Um, how on earth can they not care? And I don't know. I, I find that to be an amazing conundrum. I mean, I just don't know, is my honest and final answer. If you can think of something, please let me know. Thank you. Um, there is uncertainty in what may happen, of course, but it seems to me that there is certain certainty that we're in trouble. Yes. And and so if there's certainty certainty that we're in trouble, once we take that deep dive, is there certainty that we can't get out, can't recover, can't can't uh, rebuild the earth? Good question. Yeah, I think it's certain that we're in deep trouble. Um, but exactly when it will be deep, deep, and who will be affected, and exactly by when. And, you know, once again, it so much depends upon what we all do, right? So these international agreements have been helpful to a degree. Maybe COP28 happening in a couple of weeks. Some miracle will happen. Um, but I'm not sure we should hold our breath. Um, I'm sort of wandering here. Um, could you restate your question a little bit more succinctly? I also think I'm just getting tired. My mouth is tired. So 2050, you know, 2100, uh, we, we, we haven't done what we need to do. Right. Is there a way, is there a way back? Oh, OK, yeah. Well, that's, that's a very important point. For some things, for some systems, there will be a way back. But for example, if the thermohaline circulation in the Atlantic collapses, you know, that's not going to come back. Um, we could reverse and reduce the degree of just the temperature increase of the Earth by a lot of mitigation and even mitigation below the level where we want to be eventually. So some things are reversible. But some things aren't. Let's say, for example, um, corals. You know, co the corals are, <laughs> we're in trouble, but the corals are in really, really deep trouble. And yeah, there are all sorts of um, adaptations being developed for them, seeding them in other places by humans moving corals around and so forth. But I still, I doubt that the major, that would take such a huge effort. I think it's very likely that we'll just lose all the corals, actually. So there's also the problem of just what climate changes can't be reversed, but also what impacts can or can't be reversed. And um, you know, when you look at the information about the rate of extinction of animals on the Earth, it's just horrendous at this point. I'm not saying that's all due to climate change, but certainly some of it is. I'm sorry, I can't be more optimistic. I'm not a, by the way, I'm, I'm not inherently an optimistic person, just to let you know. All right. Um, before we conclude tonight's event, I just wanted to have one announcement that the Morgan lecture that was supposed to be happening on Tuesday with Audra Simpson is postponed and won't be happening on Tuesday, unfortunately. 
Um, but with that, that concludes tonight's program. So please join me in thanking Dr. Mirens. Thank you. I just want to add that there, there was an optimistic message uh, there from Linda when asked about what keeps you from lying down and giving up. Right. And the answer being you. And the answer is you, and you, and you, and you. And for each other, you all have close ones, distant ones. You don't lie down and give up because of your connections to other people. And I think that's a really powerful message from Linda tonight. And thank you very much. Linda. Oh, I got through it.